thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, this is a paper about, as uh, Hamed said, ESG metrics in executive compensation. And the motivation is pretty clear to everyone uh, in the room right now because the ESG uh, has become uh, probably the most talked about and uh, a fashionable topic in this space. And there's been a growing interest and growing pressure about uh, uh, both normatively in the policy space and in the finance uh, uh, literature, in the legal literature, about the idea of corporate directors taking into account when they make business decisions, not only the interests of shareholders, as traditionally uh, corporate governance has been understood over the decades, but also the interests of other stakeholders, consumers, uh, uh, the environment, suppliers, uh, workers, and so on and so forth. And there's been a growing support for this proposition that corporate directors should take into account the interests of stakeholders. There's been, in 2019, a very prominent and much talked about statement by the Business Roundtable, prominent association of leading CEOs uh, that pledged their support for this stakeholderist approach. Davos Manifesto, a couple of months later, did the same thing. And there have been also uh, uh, financial economists and management experts and legal scholars uh, backing uh, uh, this idea that uh, corporate directors should care about stakeholders and their power, their discretion, fiduciary discretion, should ex be expanded to encompass also stakeholder interests. And by contrast, there have been critics. And uh, Lucian Babchuk and I, together with Kobe Castiel, uh, have been writing extensively uh, to try to point out what the shortcomings of this idea uh, might be. And our main critique has been that uh, corporate directors do not have incentives to care about stakeholders. So if we expand their power uh, legally or by private ordering arrangements to empower them to make decisions that do not, they're not accountable to shareholders only, but also to stakeholders, they will use this discretion however, however they want and certainly do not have incentives to use it in favor for the benefit of stakeholders. So the ESG compensation uh, trend comes uh, in a way as a response to ours and others' critique about the incentives of corporate directors. And the, the idea is, yes, maybe you're right. Corporate directors do not have enough incentives to care about stakeholders. But maybe we, should, we can give them those incentives. We can improve uh, corporate directors' incentives by incorporating in their uh, compensation contracts some uh, metrics that measure uh, stakeholder interests and stakeholder uh, welfare. And there, as, as you can imagine, there's been some uh, interesting uh, growing trends uh, in the adoption by many large companies of ESG compensation metrics and institutional investors seem to uh, like it or at least to say uh, that they like it. An Edelman survey shows that two-thirds of institutional investors want ESG incorporated in compensation arrangements and uh, uh, prominent uh, compensation consultants, uh, of course, uh, like this and have been uh, 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 pushing uh, the idea of ESG metric as, as one of them said, a surefire way to make sure a company's ESG priorities are given the attention required. So maybe this can solve the incentives problems we've been concerned about and maybe ESG metrics can actually be a way to implement uh, stakeholder governance in large corporations. So uh, this is the motivation of the papers and we were curious about how companies are doing this. So this is a, a simple descriptive paper trying to understand what are the trends in this field and what lessons we can learn from these trends and what we can expect, what we should expect from the uh, continuation uh, of, these, uh, of these trends. 
And we look at the uh, actual, we, we, we try to do this the old fashioned way, manually reviewing uh, the disclosure in the proxy statements of SAP 100 companies, uh, the compensation management discussion analysis of the proxy statements to see what kind of metrics they use, what they say about these metrics, how these uh, uh, ESG metrics uh, work, and if they make sense uh, 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 at all. And we identify two key problems. So first of all, these ESG metrics uh, concern only a subset of interests, while the rhetoric around stakeholders is pretty uh, 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 broad and uh, take into account uh, a number of interests. And even from a conceptual standpoint, we can identify, we can uh, think about a very large set of uh, stakeholder interests that potentially uh, directors uh, could take into account. ESG metrics focus on only, only on a very narrow subset of them. And uh, secondly, and more importantly, the disclosure about the ESG metrics is very, very poor. And outside reviewers, whether a stakeholder, a shareholder, or a researcher uh, reading this and uh, reviewing these disclosures, cannot effectively assess what kind of incentives directors uh, have been given, and what kinds of uh, performance uh, uh, these metrics are measured. And the risk, of course, of this is that uh, uh, corporate leaders uh, can use these ESG metrics in a way to cater to these uh, uh, fashionable trends, but at the same time to increase performance in sensitive pay, because when no one can actually assess what they're measuring, uh, they can actually uh, uh, increase their pay without producing value for shareholders, for sure, by definition, by construction and even for stakeholders because we are we have no way to assess whether they actually increase stakeholder uh, welfare so uh, uh, the, the our uh, conclusion here is that um, uh, this trend uh, doesn't look great doesn't look very promising and it can uh, we don't know whether it actually help uh, stakeholder interests and it can exacerbate uh, traditional agency problems. Uh, 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 analyzing the executive compensation literature. So a little bit of, of actual uh, data here. Uh, we look at 97 US companies, including the SAP 100 index, with our aggre aggregate market cap of 20, 26 trillion, so a pretty uh, significant, even if small in number, significant economically uh, sample, um, with a CEO mean compensation of 25 million in the sample. We review the 2021 proxy statements, which uh, discuss uh, uh, metrics and goals for the uh, previous, so 2020 uh, uh, year, uh, fiscal year. Uh, and we look at use of ESG metrics for CEO compensation, analyzing the goals, the outcomes, the weights of the ESG uh, base compensation relative to the uh, all uh, CEO compensation, and what kind of contextual information uh, is given to uh, shareholders or to, uh, uh, to the public to try to assess the, uh, the effectiveness and meaningfulness of these uh, ESG metrics. And about half of the S&P 100 companies use ESG compensation metrics, so it's a pretty, uh, uh, it's a growing and already pretty widespread uh, practice. Uh, almost, you know, all eight, more than 80% of these metrics are about employee treatments or sometimes 63% uh, employee composition, so diversity, uh, mainly of the, of, of the uh, workers. Uh, about half about customers, 40% environment, 20% uh, community, and only uh, a few actually about suppliers. And first of all, the first problem we identify is that the weight of these ESG metrics is almost, is only in a minority of cases, is disclosed. So 27 percent of companies tell us how much these ESG metrics 
way for the determination of the entire compensation. So there's something about ESG in the proxy. There's something about we take into account these ESG factors to determine CEO compensation, but they don't tell us how much these factors weigh. Um, and when the weight is disclosed, in most cases, it's very modest, around 1.53% of total pay, so not a very relevant uh, factor. And even the, the, the outliers are still quite small. So our company, 12%, American Express, less than 7%, Ford, 4%. And this is just the weight for the whole uh, annual compensation, so given that specific year. But if we look at the whole CEO incentive portfolio, so all the stocks they've been given in the previous years, of course, this is even further diluted and the weight of ESG metrics is even uh, lower. Um, the first problem is I was mentioning is the narrowness of ESG metrics. We can, first of all, there's a, a, a in the management literature, there's been a, uh, uh, decades of discussion of what uh, what should qualify as a stakeholder, right? But even if we focus on the core stakeholders, and we can think about many potential interests, pay, job security, or for example, employees, like right? pay, job security, uh, culture, diversity, a number of things. But the metrics inevitably can focus only on a narrow subset of these dimensions. And this can also uh, pose a problem that has been highlighted in the uh, 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 multitasking literature by, uh, from uh, um, uh, uh, also, <coughs> ben also, uh, and uh, uh, the, the subsequent uh, uh, literature building on his model. Uh, when easy to measure and hard to measure tasks compete for the agent's attention, uh, performance evaluation may distort allocation of agents' time and effort. So it's, to give you some examples, and uh, some dimensions of what employees uh, may care about, health and benefits, pay ratio, fairness of compensation, absolute level of compensation. When we look at what actual ESG metrics measure, it's something quite, uh, and it's a narrow subset of this, and uh, as I uh, explained one second, it's also something different to actually assess in class, inclusive culture, fair and balanced treatment, inclusion and equity, talent development, so on and so forth. The second problem, which is the most important problem we should be uh, uh, worried about in these ESG metrics uh, trends is managerial opportunism, of course. Over the last few decades, uh, the, key, uh, the key word uh, in uh, executive compensation, research, and policy has been transparency, shareholder oversight to limit managerial opportunism and agency problems. And there have been uh, many policy interventions in these directions, uh, more disclosure, the same pay votes, uh, investor push for pay for performance and through their proxy advisors a lot of uh, progress that you know recent people uh, disagree on the extent of progress on what has been accomplished but certainly the trend has been in trying to limit managerial opportunism through transparency more oversight of shareholders and the problem with uh, ESG metric is that it can bring us back and actually uh, uh, make us uh, uh, do a few step, steps back in, this, uh, uh, in the direction of transparency and uh, effective ex outside reviewability of uh, what incentives corporate leaders are given. And we identify uh, three uh, main ideal uh, uh, goals that uh, compensation metrics should aim at. Uh, clear ob objective goals given to the, to the manager, so no discretion of the uh, um, compensation committee, full disclosure of what the incentives or what the goals, the objectives that are being assigned to the CEO are, the outcome should be disclosed to, uh, to evaluate the outside reviewer, shareholder, stakeholder, or whoever, to see whether the, 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 the goalpost has been uh, achieved. 
and meaningful context to allow the assessment of whether the incentives given, the goal given, is actually meaningful, is actually able to modify, to influence the CEO's decisions. Now, without this, there's the problem I was mentioning at the beginning, that uh, uh, corporate managers can use ESG metrics uh, which make them look good in the eye of public opinion and maybe some stakeholders to actually increase their pay without increasing their performance. And let me give you some examples. I didn't know there were. Uh, luckily, I didn't use uh, Chevron or any other uh, others in the room. Um, the Compensation Committee considers various financial and non-financial measures, including shareholder return, ESG, and human capital metrics, including diversity and inclusion, how we build trust and credibility in the community we serve and represent a company people want to work for, invest in, and do business with. We can make sense of this, right? Uh, ConocoPhillips is a little bit more like quantitative, top quartile performance, an industry leader with respect to total recordable rate of accidents. It's a clear goal. The outcome is disclosed, but we don't, we don't have enough information to make sense of this. How was the performance last year? Maybe it was already top quartile. How, was, how, how does this mean, what, what, are the, what are competitors, what's the difference like in terms of absolute value between top quartile? Maybe it's just one accident less. Maybe it's not a meaningful incentives. Maybe this doesn't really uh, affect and influence behavior and uh, management decisions. Of 25 companies using ESG metrics in our sample, only 18 disclose clear objective goals, eight disclose also the outcomes, and only one, it's a subjective evaluation, right? Uh, you can uh, see for yourselves in our appendix, there are, there's a lot of words uh, produced by these companies uh, only one in our judgment produces uh, sufficient contextual information to uh, tell us, uh, uh, to uh, enable us to assess this trend. So basically, we think that uh, one can say that this can develop and become a better uh, phenomenon, but there are some obstacles that are hard to uh, overcome. And certainly, if, if companies take this seriously, and it, if it's normatively, we believe that it's the right thing to do to take it seriously, certainly the direction to go and the way to assess if they are doing it uh, genuinely and in the right way is to try to look whether uh, it's reviewable and accessible from outside point of view, what they're doing, what kind of incentives uh, they're doing to CEOs. Right now, this is not uh, what it's advertised uh, to be. Uh, thank you. All right, thanks. It's been a super interesting morning. We've seen a couple of good papers and um, some nice discussions. Um, I, both Peter and Kathleen did a great job there. Um, I also am, am thinking when I'm watching Ilyev speak that maybe he's got a sideline as a stand-up comic <laughs> so, sort of thing, sort of thing going. I, I mean, I don't know. Do you go to school for that or you know? And, uh, and the other thing is, you know, so Kathleen is kind of uh, uh, with a paper galvanized by fire from 10 prior discussions. And the, gu the guardrails that go with that, uh, I think she still found some very interesting things to say about the paper, you know, to, to your credit. Thanks. Um, okay, so uh, uh, Lucian and Roberto have a, a fine piece of work. It's, it's also not forthcoming in Journal of Corporation Law. It forthcame in uh, the Journal of Corporation Law, yes. yes. So I'm a, I'm a little guard railed in here on this too, and so my comment should be interpreted as, as enriching or amplifying and possibly suggesting ways forward for further work that would build upon um, the extensive stream of work um, by these authors. So my, uh, my uh, take on uh, the paper is that uh, questionable promise, that's multitasking, and uh, we've got a limited uh, subsets of shareholders uh, that are designated 
as um, those who might benefit from um, these kinds of objectives, for these kinds of metrics. And uh, perils, there are agency problems. And lack of transparency can aggravate agency problems. And I've got slightly different uh, take on both of these things. I'm going to do these four things and maybe a fifth. Um, the fifth won't make me any friends, so maybe I'll stop <laughs> before I get there. But the first thing is I'm going to, uh, to kind of reframe um, this work uh, a little bit and uh, do it a little more technically uh, than the authors have. I have an iceberg comment, and I have um, a multitasking and disclosure comments. Uh, I agree uh, with the conclusions there, but, um, and for some of the same reasons, but for different reasons as well. So uh, let's start with the framework. Here is uh, just a picture from one of Murphy's survey papers. There's lots. Maybe we should survey Murphy's survey papers. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure. But, um, but here's a picture from his 2012 survey. This is an annual bonus. And uh, so there is a uh, performance criterion on the horizontal axis. And there's a threshold below which you get nothing in your annual bonus above it. You bump up, there's a discrete jump, there's an incentive zone, and then there's a ceiling where there's a maximum. And by the way, the incentive zone often has a kink in the middle of it at target uh, right here, so it could be convex or it could be, could be concave. So the back end instrument here is cash, yes. But this, of course, uh, invites one to think about what if the back end instrument were a uh, stock or options, okay? And so when that is the form of the pay contract, the award, then um, you have, right, that, that picture I just put up is the grant schedule, and then you're basically for the value of the back end award multiplying by the value of the option or the stock at the end. And so um, if n is the number of shares or options, shares here that you got, then the back end value at the end of the performance period uh, based on say an accounting metric and a stock metric or you know, lots of metrics can go into these things, you would multiply the number of units you received by the stock price or by the number of call options that you received. So here is uh, 2008. This is pre-ESG. I'm going to focus a little bit there because um, um, I think we, you say we're interested in trends, and I, th I think we are. And so 2021 is, is one snapshot, um, but let's, let's look back in time a little bit. So this is Amgen, uh, Mr. Scherer's, uh, the CEO of Amgen. And um, here is the grant schedule, the back-end instrument of stock. Okay, but it looks like kind of the you know the 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 bonus you know annual bonus plan sort of thing, but uh, that where that's cash is the back end instrument. This is stock. There's a threshold. There's a ceiling. There's a target, and then the back end value of this thing. It's a three year three year uh, performance period. This is TSR total stock return over three years. The back end value of this award looks like that. Okay, so now. Um, and, I, and this is a point, I'm, I'm, I'm going to use this later. The issue here is um, how, how do I, without that information, know even how to calculate the value of the award, much less the accumulated portfolio and the dispositions of a sequence awards, how do I know to calculate the value of the award? I need to know all this stuff. Okay, and uh, so uh, executives, I believe, would we'd want them to have clear line of sight to the value of their economic opportunity. We'd like them to understand uh, what happens to their portfolio of awards like this if they actually increase stock price by one percent or whatever it is. And uh, you might also want to know what happens to the value of this award if you change the volatility of the underlying, which would be total stock return here. So, so you can do that the day of the award. You can do it uh, uh, one month in, et cetera, et cetera. And so you could, you could potentially have a dashboard on the value, delta, right, the incentive properties and delta and vega of these awards. Uh, but you need to know some stuff. Okay. So here are those two side by side. Uh, obviously, you get something that's more convex when you uh, make it quadratic. Um, but that's just a summary of my remarks there. These are pictures from our 2018 uh, Journal of Mechanical Economics and uh, 2010 RFS. Okay, so the iceberg comment, um, um, right? The question is, right, and most of the information you have is on annual, annual bonuses, okay? So the question is, is this stuff going to be percolating into grant schedules 
performance vesting grant schedules attached to stock and option awards, right? That's the question. So, so we took a, I took a quick look at Bloomberg. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so this is, this is my, my snarky comment about tr uh, trend, right? You're not actually looking at trends because you got 2021 data. So, so there's a little more data here. And yes, uh, ESG embedded uh, stuff in executive compensation has been going up in the uh, S&P uh, 500. And um, the metric types in terms of environmental and social, here are some of them. And, and, it's, and the data are rough, right? It's, it's hard to read this stuff. This is coming from Incentive Lab data. Incentive Lab is built on the S&P 1500, both forward and backfilled. Um, so, um, and, and I have a small disclosure to make. Um, I was a founder and co-chief scientist of Incentive Lab. We sold in 2014. My, my transition arrangement is gone, so, so I'm not advertising ISS Incentive Lab <laughs> at all. Although, they would send me money maybe if I did. I don't, I, I don't really know. Yeah, yeah, right, right, yeah. Yeah, so um, at, at any rate, so is this penetrating into um, a, a bigger chunk of, I mean, annual bonus? Yeah, I like having an annual bonus, but some of these stock grants are huge, and um, we are actually seeing the, uh, the stock grants, we're seeing this penetrate to use in stock grants in a, in a significant way over the last few years, okay? So this is, this is uh, kind of supporting the notion, the statements you're making about trends uh, with uh, data over the 2018-2021 uh, time period. Um, all right, so multitasking. I'm going to say multitasking is not new. Um, I mean, it, maybe it's new with ESG metrics, but it's, but it's not new. Um, a lot of times, um, you know, and this is, this is just uh, data on uh, kind of performance metrics, and these numbers on accounting and stock price and other stuff add up to more than 100%. So we already, so we know that the multitasking problem is not new. Um, I'm going to say that in the Macy's case, uh, here's another 2008 award. Um, okay, three-year performance period. You get nothing if EBITDA doesn't hit eight billion. Okay, if it hits eight billion, then you have these kind of kinked uh, grant schedules, and about half of the award is targeted uh, based on EBITDA margin. 30% on um, ROIC, oh, and here we go, 20% based on total stock return relative to a 16-member peer group. Okay, so, so that's, that's pretty simple, uh, not. Okay, so what's a manager to do? Uh, is there a clear line of sight? I, uh, you know, so, so the multitasking problem is still there. Now, to be fair, accounting numbers and stock return might be sort of more closely related, okay, than ESG. Uh, and accounting and stock returns and, you know, and stock value, maybe, maybe not. But I'm hearing from those who are uh, interested in ESG that they are, in fact, using ESG as a risk filter to under, you know, ah, oh, we don't really care about ESG per se, we care about it because it indicates risks of the, per, of the particular company. Right? That's, that's the story I'm hearing. Um, I'm not sure that's right, but if that's true, then it's just the same as before, accounting numbers, uh, there's multitasking there um, with, with uh, stock returns too, okay. All right, so disclosure matters. I agree, it matters for rent extraction, okay. On the other hand, uh, I think it matters in the absence of uh, rent extraction, and, and I, I would have made that case. I, I think um, back to the slide where I had value, delta, and vega, um, it matters because an executive wants clear line of sight to their economic opportunity. I think it matters because investors, shareholders are interested in the incentive properties of pay and correct measures of the level of pay. So I'm, I, I agree on disclosure, but, but uh, maybe uh, for additional reasons in addition to um, um, potential rent extraction. Um, so, uh, you know, of course, it's a complicated thing. You have to know the functional form of the grant schedule. You have to know the functional form of the ex, ex post payoff. And you have to decide on what you're going to do to drift the state variable. Oh, and by the way, if you're going to drift the state variable, the compensation plan that you put in place might actually, ex uh, I mean, it's, it's supposed to affect the, the rate of drift in, in the state variable, right? So, so that's kind of an additional uh, uh, kind of um, circularity in this, and that's a complication. Um, so at any rate, that's, um, uh, yeah, I'm going to stay out of trouble. What do I got? 
You, you know, I'm the only one with a tie in this room, and I'm looking at my August session chair, and he's got that really nice turtle neck on, and I got, I got a bunch of them, but, but, but when I wear them at home, my children look at me, they look up and down, and they say, hey, what's happening, daddy-o? <laughs> I mean, I mean pe pe people who grew up in the turtleneck era, you know, maybe... Maybe I know about that. Okay. At any rate, that's um, that's my discussion. A really, really interesting paper. It's a nice way to uh, end end uh, uh, the morning. And um, I, you know, I agree, amplify, and enrich um, some of the uh, some of the conclusions in your work. Um, and I'm happy to talk to you about uh, the other 23 papers of yours <laughs> that you put on that slide earlier at the break. Um, thank you. Yeah, just a quick, uh, quick comment that uh, uh, I want to thank uh, our discussant for very useful, interesting comments. And I'm, I remain curious about the mystery slide that you didn't want to show us. Uh, but uh, I think we can talk about this uh, at, the, at the coffee break. The slides you didn't, you didn't show us. Uh, we'll talk about this. At, So I agree with, with all the things you said. I think uh, the basic concern here when we talk about ESG metrics is even more like uh, basic. Uh, we're not even in the region where if we don't know uh, all the, uh, the, 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 the structure of the function and the, 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 the payoff schedule, uh, we, are, we have imperfect information. We are in a region where you know, the vast majority of companies don't even tell us uh, what the quantitative goal is. Uh, they just use some uh, rhetoric around, uh, you know, some, some slogans, uh, inclusion, uh, sustainability, and they don't even tell us what they're trying to achieve, what the goals that the CEO is given uh, are. Even qualitatively, sometimes it's even it's very hard to make any sense of these disclosures. So one might imagine, if you are um, an optimist, that uh, uh, the CEO gets much more information and they actually know what they're doing or what they're trying to achieve in terms of sustainability, diversity, inclusion, or workshop uh, workplace uh, culture. But if you are like more realistic, it's it's probably as vague as uh, you can uh, tell from the from the proxy statement. So even before, you know, all the problems that we already have, as you correctly point out, with uh, fi traditional financial measure, where where we already have multitasking issues or um, uh, low transparency or not a very clear line of sight for managers because it's very complicated to figure out actually how their decision are going to affect their payoff. We are here in a much more um, uh, flawed environment. And the risk here is, is just that nobody can control what's happening. And the competition committee has free hands to do what they want in terms of adjusting for maybe a poor financial performance or other things just by uh, attributing some kind of uh, compensation components to some vague uh, ESG goals that can be easily said it's been achieved because nobody can actually, can actually double check. So I take all the comments. They're very interesting for future work. But I think that when we talk about ESG, and there's a lot to talk about ESG, these days, we should be very clear that right now, it's a black box where compensation committee can basically do a lot of things without any oversight by shareholders or stakeholders or anyone else. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one question. Oh yeah. No. Thanks. Uh, this is a question for Jeff. So in your discussion, you mentioned um, that ESG was being used as an initial filter for some form of risks. 
So out of curiosity, can you say a bit more about what types of risk, especially because stock prices are included? So th presumably this will be risk over and above what's captured, you know, in stock in the stock price itself. Yeah. So, uh, so Roberto, for sure, uh, to start with, for sure, um, you know, the disclosure issue is uh, is is huge. It's they don't even specify what the thing is, and um, a lot of times when they do specify, it doesn't actually measure a whole lot of anything anyway, and uh, they don't tell you if it's one and a half or three and a half percent, et cetera. All right. So, so back to your question. Thank you. Um, so, so the uh, um, um, the portfolio managers. Um, uh, so I, I sit on some investment committees, let's just say, and I'm, I'm not going to say much more than that, but the portfolio managers um, who make that case to me, right, the ESG, we use ESG not because we care about ESG, but we think it's an, uh, an additional indicator of, of uh, organizational risk in some cases. Um, so that's what they say. So the G parts could be some aspects of G are indicating risk in other aspects of G. Um, e is indicating risk of EPA enforcement or, um, or sort of being in the wrong product market. And uh, S, they're telling us, well, we, you know, we kind of worry about employee engagement and, uh, and whether or not um, employees are going to be working to enhance shareholder value. Right. So, so they get back to shareholder value, uh, but they find a way to uh, use ESG at least talk about GSG, say something in their proxy statements about ESG, maybe put it in their compensation in a, in a material way, but, but maybe not. Does it, is that, is that help? I guess it's some form of tail risk that's not captured by uh, Yeah, okay. yeah, that's, that's, that's right.